Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at texasconflictcoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. In this digitally connected age, social media has become a powerful tool to advance peace. Through the use of Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, peacemakers are moving beyond the click to engage, organize, and educate. Join us today in this inter- at this intersection of technology and peace to learn how we can cross the conflict divide to work towards meaningful change. Hello, I'm your guest host, Stephen Kotov, and joining me today for our program entitled Beyond the Click, How Social Media is Being Used to Build Peace, is Dr. Craig Zelzer. Dr. Zelzer is Interim Director of the Conflict Resolution Program at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and is founder and CEO of the Peace and Collaborative Development Network, the world's largest leading online network connecting over 33,000 peace builders across the world, across the globe. Dr. Zelizer's areas of expertise include working with youth from violent conflict regions, civil society development and capacity building in trans transitional societies, program evaluation and design, conflict sensitivity and conflict mainstreaming, the connection between trauma and conflict, the role of the private sector in peace building, and arts in peace building. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thanks. I'm delighted to be here and, and talk with you and hear about your work. Well, actually, we're going to be hearing about you, my friend. And one of the first questions I have is, is what drew you to this work in peace building? I would say as far back as I go in terms of a younger age, I've always been interested in issues of social justice and social change. And, you know, I'm 44, and I grew up spending a lot of time worrying about nuclear Armageddon back when there was the Cold War between the U.S. and the USSR. And I'm not necessarily a fan of socialism or communism, but I didn't believe that the Soviet Union or or particularly the people were evil. And so I became, even at a younger age, just interested in trying to understand the other, at least the country that we were and symbolic conflict with and potentially a nuclear war, you know, had that potential. And so just kind of growing up, that was a big component of how I understood the world and the desire to try to understand and challenge the discourse of, you know, the evil other and kind of a monolithic whole empire. And in high school, I was involved in some social justice activities. That I don't want to oversell what I did, but had some really inspiring history teachers and health teachers and got involved in a little bit of anti-apartheid activism or nuclear disarmament protests. Uh, Again, I don't want to oversell what I did, but I went to a few protests at the UN or New York City. And then I'd say where it really started is my brother, I have a brother who's two and a half years older than I am, and he's been a pretty big positive influence on my life. And he went to university, and this is probably in about 88 or 86 or somewhere in that time period. And he took a peace studies course um, where he went to university and came home with a peace studies textbook. And the textbook was really bad. I think it was something that was handmade by a particular faculty person, but it had some of the core concepts of conflict resolution and peace building. And I read that and was kind of like, this is really interesting. And I think that's where I was able to first put a name into or identify what it is I was particularly interested in. And then obviously when I went to university, at University of Massachusetts at Amherst, that really led to much larger social social engagement and social activism. I had a wonderful undergraduate major, and I decided to study abroad in my junior year, and I purposely didn't want to go somewhere that everybody else went, like France or Germany or England. Not that there's anything wrong with those countries, but I wanted to go somewhere different. Um, and I got it narrowed down to two or three countries. In the end, I picked Hungary, which I knew nothing about, um, not, not, not anything, and um, wound up originally supposed to go for a semester, but stayed a year. And this was about probably eight months after the end of the Cold War, or at least the collapse of the Berlin Wall. 
or maybe a year afterwards. So it really transformed my life, in, both in terms of the cultural experience living in Hungary and the issues that they have, and also having kind of close contacts and spending time in Yugoslavia before, before the wars broke out. That really had a huge impact on me as well. Well, and and that was partly what we're interested in is is that it sounds like a lot of the work that you've done has been dedicated towards peace and peace building. And I was hoping you could help us with some just simple definitions. You know, how do you define peace building? And then from there, you know, we're talking about social media and how social media is being used. How do we talk about social media? You know, how do you define social media as well? What's the what's your definitions for those two concepts? Um, I mean. P- I mean, in terms of peace and peace building, I think it's first important to start with there's one of the founders of the field, Johann Galtung, who I was fortunate enough to study with. Um, he came up with a very simple definition that there's negative peace and positive peace. And negative peace is when there's the absence of war or violence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's true peace. And positive peace is much more when there's the, uh, the relationships and the way society is structured it allows, allows basically every individual to reach their full potential. Um, so, the, so, so the difference between negative and positive peace is quite important because it's possible that there could be a military presence, you know, in a community or a police presence, and there's not necessarily any outright violence, but it's still not positive peace. And peace building is a profession and a discipline, and it's a way of helping communities and societies to develop the best relationships and institutions to work towards positive peace and end conflict. Actually, end conflict is not the right word. I'd say try to mitigate and transform because we're, we're, we're never going to end conflict totally. The, the goal is to try to minimize the amount of violent conflict that we have. In, ter- in, terms of social, in terms of social media, that's a really hard one to define because it means many different things. But in general, I'd say you know, media traditionally is a way of there's traditionally been journalists who communicate to the public, you know, about social issues or the arts or culture or fashion. And there's generally been journalists who produce the content and distribute it to people who consume it, which is really just a one-way distribution. And social media has really come about with the age of the Internet and apps and smartphones. And instead of it only being about journalists producing information that's then consumed, it's about anybody who has access to technology, you know, whether it's a smartphone or a computer, can create their own media where they're both the creators and distributors and they're engaging in a social paradigm and sharing it with their friends, their colleagues, and people around the world. So it's really going from one-way distribution of information to where anybody anywhere who at least has basic access to tool, the tools can be part of creating media. Um, and I, and, I, and some, some of the social media can be as high quality as professional journalism. For example, there are now people who make their living just doing full-time blogging, where they might be writing, again, it could be about fashion, food, arts, conflict, you know, but some some government institutions or intergovernmental organizations have even recognized bloggers as journalists. So there's, there's still debate about that. Um, and then the well, inter- so, so, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to surmise, because you're giving us a lot here, so, you know, the first part is is that there's this concept of just because people aren't fighting doesn't necessarily mean that it's peaceful, that it's much more about allowing folks to reach their full potential. And then with that, you know, social media is also very vast. You know, but Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, that's what we know right now in this day and age. Those are some of the classic examples, right? Exactly. And so yeah, when did you start to see – oh, go ahead – no, so I would say, you know, the, I would say without the basically with the beginning of the widespread use of the internet, where basically people could start connecting directly with one each other. Obviously, we've had the telephone for, you know, many many decades, if not a hundred years almost. But you know, so the telephone was one way of people connecting directly. The internet has just sped it up dramatically, and so really with the launch of the internet, you know, originally it started in defense department, came to universities, and now it's basically. You know, I don't know the internet penetration in the U.S. Probably 85% of the U.S. population has access to internet. You know, so really, most people in the U.S. can, at a click, find any amount of information they want or interact with someone else on the other side of the world. And so it, it predates Facebook or all the other tools. But people talk about um, social media or the internet 1.0, which was really just basic when we just started having email. And then, you know, Internet 2.0, which is really starting some of the social media communication. 
such as Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. I mean, it's impossible to keep track because there's always a new tool that's out there. And now people are talking about Internet or you know, social media 3.0, which is much more really revolutionizing everything, and it's much more kind of peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, so, and some people probably even say we're we're going into 4.0, which we don't really even know what that's going to be. So, when did you actually see these different types of social media being used for peace building? Um, I mean, well, I mean, the first thing I should say is that for there's been a long tradition of using media for peace building, and and the exact opposite of people using media to exacerbate conflict and push people to fight each other. So, so one of the things that if you look in any historical conflict or textbook or movie about conflict, and this this is basic conflict resolution, that most people have a hard time doing violent things to people they see as friends or peers. Part of the conflict, part of the generation of conflict is the media where people will use it to dehumanize or talk about people they're in conflict with as different than them and not worthy and dangerous and kind of over time through the media and the, and the perfect example of this is in Rwanda with the hate radio between the Tutsis and the Hutus. You know, the, the Hutu-led government basically led a campaign that went on for, you know, about, you know, I don't know, six months to one year, maybe a little bit shorter, where they just demonized the Tutsis as responsible for all the horrible things in the country and even used really quite negative words such as cockroaches and, you know, Tutsis are subhuman and that kind of discourse over a long period of time was adopted by a lot of the society, not everybody. And when the first acts of the genocide started, that kind of that cultural discourse of saying the Hutu, the Tutsis are dangerous, helped legitimize the violence that was carried out against them. Um, so there's there's many examples of media being used for both negative things such as in Rwanda or positive things to help promote understanding. And social media is a more recent phenomenon of trying to use these new tools, but in some ways it's not that different from the way media has been used in the past. It's just now that anybody can have access to it who, ha who has a, you know, basic Internet ac access. Right. And and so, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm hearing you, you talk about how there are – things that have been going on for a very long time where you know th th there's there's the use of of the media to perpetuate problems and then there's the, also the use to try to go and uh either um slow things down or to try to go and um uh prevent things from getting worse and mm -hmm. that was one of the ways that it was it was manifested and so um I just want to remind folks that uh they're listening to the Texas conflict uh, coach blog talk radio program with your guest host myself Stephen Kotev. Today I'm joined by Dr. Craig Zelizer as part of our celebration of Conflict Resolution Month. We're discussing beyond the click how social media is being used for peace. And you know this was sort of the next part that I'm seeing is just so you know we talk about crossing this conflict divide. How is social media being used to sort to build peace? Um, I mean, there's there's a couple, couple of practical examples. So one is, for example, Facebook set up a page about three years ago where I think it's peace.facebook.com where one of the things they were keeping track of is the number of people connected to each other across a particular conflict divide. So you can look and they would show, you know, within the past month, I'm making up a number, 50,000 Indians and Pakistanis have become friends on Facebook or 50,000 Israelis and Palestinians are you know, the same between Irani Iranians and Israelis. And so one thing that's happening with social media is that people can directly connect with their enemies or the people they don't know on other sides of the world. That If you think there used to be pen pals, you know, I, th I think I had a pen pal growing up as a 13-year-old, and you would write a letter and it would come back a month later. So the idea is now that this is almost like rapid pen pal ability where you can connect with anybody around the world who's like-minded or totally different than you and start exploring commonalities and differences. Um, so, so, you know, so Facebook has provided the ability for people to connect in ways that have never been done before. Twitter, all the different tools of social media are providing ways for people to engage and understand each other. Um, and so, for example, there's a project that's called Solia, which is an online dialogue network where they bring together youth from U.S. universities and European universities with youth in Muslim-majority societies. 
and they go through, they're trained in terms of basic facilitation and dialogue techniques, and then over, I think it's a 10-week period, they have weekly facilitated dialogue about issues that are important to youth, and it could be things on conflict or religion, but it could also just be things, you know, what is your life like, you know, for people who are living in Lebanon, which is affected by conflict, um, you know, and, and is a very dangerous neighborhood, and Lebanese youth can connect with Israeli youth and connect with youth in the U.S., and the idea is that through these tools, they're creating the opportunity for much deeper understanding of the other. And ideally, after this understanding, that that would lead to some kind of concrete positive action in the future. Um, and, and so, Leah, I know the head of the organization, you know, he likes to say that this is a much more cost-effective way to reach a huge scale or number of people that, I mean, tr there's traditional international exchanges, which can be very beneficial, it changed my life, it can be very expensive and time-consuming, and providing a platform where people can connect and start to dialogue and understand each other without necessarily having to travel thousands of miles can really, you know, instead of reaching 100 people, it can reach tens of thousands. Well, it, this also reminds me of, um, uh, there's a guy named uh, Ronnie Edry, and he was the guy who did the uh, Israel loves Iran, Iran yeah, loves exactly. Israel, or Palestine mm -hmm. loves Israel. And he's a he was a graphic designer who went and put images of hearts and used that as uh, through Facebook to, to to build that relationship, but also to communicate something other than the aggression that they were hearing. Is, is that another exactly. example? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful example. You know, so he started off just as an average Israeli who was concerned about the es escalating tensions between Israel and Iran where it looked like there could be potential bombing or war and just out of the desire to do something like you said he started creating images and it spread within Israel to Iran and around the world and they got tremendous media attention and you know covered in most of the international press and started a whole movement um, one of the challenges with social media is just because something is put online does it actually lead to change or behavior behavioral change or policy change that that's one of the big challenges um, so I think his actions definitely created a lot more awareness that there's no such thing as one group of Israelis who all think the same or one group of Iranians, that pe everyday people have a lot in common. I don't think his actions have led to policy changes in either regime or you know, either nation state. And that, that's one of the limitations of social media, but, but there are examples you know, where, for example, my, my wife is from Colombia, and you know, Colombia has had a civil war, a war war with two different insurgents groups going back for 60 years. And one of the main techniques that one of the main insurgent groups used for a long time, particularly starting in the 80s, is mass kidnapping of people. And at one point, I think they held about three to 4,000 people in captivity. And one of the things that happened is someone on Facebook got tired of the kidnapping. He started a camp saying, you know, no, no mass sequestros, no more kidnapping. And, and then from that campaign, organized a series of global marches that easily attracted, you know, a million people or more. You know, I don't remember how many cities. And the idea was that was to put pressure on the insurgent group and also the government to try to end kidnapping. So, so again, the question is, does that actually lead to an impact? That, that's where it gets challenging to measure. But, but there's hundreds, if not thousands, of those types of examples. Well, it sounds like it's a a great way for like-minded folks to, to rally together and support each other, you know, but it's also the other end of it of, you know, there's a concern about, you know, where is this going to go? Because, you know, I, I've, you know, this is the concept of the slacktivist, you know, where they, they sort of like my click makes a difference. And I think you're sort of yep. warning that that's the other end of it is, is that just because you hit like doesn't really mean anything changes. Exactly. And, and and that's one of the challenges today is that we're so overloaded with information because of the access to media that people don't often take the time to learn about issues in depth. And so, you know, if you're sitting on your smartphone on the bus and you click like about let's help support a cause, whether it's polar bears, you know, save the polar bears or and the conflict in South Sudan, does that actually mean anything? Um, so that that's one of the critiques of social media um, that too many people think they're actually taking positive action to affect social change and make the world better by liking something, but actually not doing anything. And so that, that's one of the real dangers. And there's a lot of critiques you know, coming from some people that social media is oversold as the panacea that's going to solve everything. And it's just another tool that really isn't doing that much. I mean, I disagree with that critique, but it's important to keep it in mind. Um, I, I want to give another example, which is probably one of my favorite 
Um, and it's not so much peace building, it's more for after disasters. But in the earthquake in Haiti um, about four or five years ago, that really leveled the country, killed 200,000 people, destroyed most of the housing in Port-au-Prince. What, this is the first, I think, example of this. It's called crisis mapping. But the, you know, the telecommunication system was knocked out, and basically what happened is a group of people inside Haiti and outside started using SMS phone messages as a way to start communicate about, you know, but those are like text messages, right? Exactly, text messages. Yeah. So somebody somebody might have been trapped in a building and they might have had access to a cell phone. They started texting, and a, and a whole volunteer group emerged that was actually based in Boston, where they started coordinating the texts and texts and map texts, and they started mapping them out on an actual internet site to try to get a sense of all the issues that were happening and the needs that people had and who was getting help and who wasn't. And they actually used that to help aid agencies and humanitarian groups on the ground pinpoint and kind of make sure people were getting the assistance they needed. And that, that was the beginning of the crisis mapping field, which has really grown exponentially. And now in a lot of countries in the world, including even the U.S., when we had Hurricane Sandy, people were using this type of technique to kind of map out, you know, what was, what was the danger, what kind of assistance did people need, who was getting hurt, who, you know, who needed rescuing. So there's now, now an entire field now where people, you know, even as long as they have access to a phone or some, you know, can get the information to someone with a phone, there's there's groups who will take all the data and tr turn that into translatable action, and and that that's that's really an example of kind of taking social media tools or mobile techniques from the grassroots to actually affecting policy change, and, and kind of another example related to this is there's often a lot of violence in some developing countries around elections. And there's different ways to try to prevent electoral violence, but one of the more interesting interesting things I've heard of recently is they actually embedded some of these crisis mappers in, this is in Nigeria, and they embedded them in like the police headquarters where they were monitoring security. And they would get reports from field volunteers saying, you know, there's a rumor that there might be some violence here or something's going on. The people doing the crisis mapping would add that all up to get a sense of what's happening across a particular state or country. And then they would share that information with police saying, it seems like something's going on here. You better you know, take preventative action. And so it's a way of kind of direct on-the-ground reporting going to kind of a policy level actually leading to change. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the concept of a bowling alley or a barber shop or the town diner where people sit around and they talk and they share what's happening, but it's happening yep. at lightning speed and it's happening through technology where, you know, okay, I got a text message from my uncle. I don't know where he is. We put that on the website and then, you know, every other people are sharing what's going on. And then that yep. becomes uh, sort of like a, when you pull off the web of a spider web, it, it pulls on the other side and you can start to see, okay, well, we got a problem here. So, exactly. you know, I, as we look at this, you know, what advice, you know, uh, what advice do you have for aspiring peacemakers, you know, as as we're, you know, talking about social media generation 3.0 or 4.0, you know, how, how do we, you know, what, what do folks do with this? You know, how do they make it relatable in their own life? Um, I mean, so I would say a couple of things. First, you know, the, the network that I do, the Peace and Collaborative Development Network is, I think, a useful resource to engage on this. And, you know, I think what, why don't you give folks the when, we're, we'll sure. we'll do it again, but right now why don't you give folks the uh, the URL for that? What's sure, the sure. website for it, that? It's, inter, it's international peace and conflict all one word dot org. So I think we're a very useful resource if people search crisis mapping, if they look up the Peacebook Friends site. But there's thousands of examples from around the world, and I think one is just making them aware. The second thing I would say is that. I'm not sure the average age of your listeners, are they millennials or in their 30s or 40s? But the second thing is to be aware for people who want to be engaged that you know, they can, there's apps that you can download that help you engage and take action on conflict issues or, you know, there, there's the crisis mapping field are always looking for people to do volunteer work where they help take in messages or map or verify the accuracy of things. So what would be some of those apps? Um, I mean, the, one of the most famous is called Ushahidi. Which is probably the uh, you, you want to you want to spell that? <laughs> yeah, U S H A I D I. Mm -hmm. I got it spelled right, and that that is actually created in Kenya hmm. um, as a response to some electoral you know, violence they had in 2008, and now it's being used around the world. 
Um, another one a friend of mine runs is a group called Frontline MS SMS. But, but I mean, there's hundreds of groups around the world and, well, and in the U.S. What do you do? So so you download this app and then what? I mean, often you have to go through some basic training, you know, and when, you know, they'll often put out a call saying there's an election coming up or there's a snowstorm or this, this activity is happening, we're looking for volunteers, and that can be, even, even with the disappearance of the Malaysia Airlines flight, the, you know, the, they still haven't figured out what happened to it in terms of where it mm-hmm. crashed. There's volunteers who are looking through, you know, satellite maps and kind of using technology to kind of notice do they see anything different and then giving that input to different people. I mean, I think that's happening in a lot of places. It might be sometimes looking through maps. It might be looking at text messages. It's kind of getting a little bit of basic training so you can understand what's happening and then giving that to the next level so they can verify the accuracy and then make recommended recommended actions. So it's it wouldn't be that different than, uh, you know, if you were to show up and decide to um, – fill sandbags because the levee's going to break. You're just doing it electronically. You're, you know, you're exactly. it's like the, whatever the crowdsourcing kind of thing of, hey, we need someone to look at this and, you know, we could find some people who could do it faster than waiting however long it would take for, you know, somebody else to do it. Exactly. And, and there's a whole field now of micro-volunteering. So the idea is you're not committing to volunteering for six months, you know, every week. You're committing to like a, a you know, very small task that you could be doing 20 minutes or one hour, depending on the amount of time you have. So, yeah, you're there. It's, it's, it's with the technology, it then allows us to have a lot more flexibility, you know, as a, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I made my commitment to go to the Peace Corps, you know, uh, uh, theoretically, and I'm going to go over there and spend X amount of time assisting and learning myself where, where I can use um, uh, different aspects of social media to learn about that country, whatever it is. But then also if something happens, maybe they need some assistance. I use an app. I get involved with a, uh, um, the sort of uh, finite amounts of assistance to help um, do the conflict mapping and so on and so forth. And so it's like a, an abbreviated, sped-up version of some of these longer-term experiences folks have had in the past. Right. And, again, but there, I mean, I'm just looking. There's a site now that's called Help From Home Micro-volunte- Micro-Volunteering. I don't, I don't know the quality of the site. You know, so so there, there's lots of these things happening around the world that are very easy to connect with, but obviously people always want to check, is the organization trustworthy and, you know, and – only so much can be done off, you know, there's only, there can only be so much impact from one-off volunteering, so that really needs to be part, you know, you might contribute your one hour, but you want to make sure there's other people working on this in the longer perspective. Well, how would they know if the site's any good? Um, I mean, I think to me, you want to look at who who's the leadership, you know, who are their partners, are they asking you for money? Hopefully not. And if they are asking you for money, are they transparent about how they use it? Um, you know, I just think basic due diligence to make sure, you know, and also see what their record is. Have they done? You know, what what accomplishments have they achieved? Mm-hmm. So those are those are really good metrics. Um, you know, as we start to wrap the show up, you know, what call to action do you have for our listeners so that they could engage with this material further? Say they want to better understand it or they want to get involved themselves. What what do you have for them? I mean, I'd say three things. So one is I would encourage people to look at PCDN, internationalpeaceandconflict.org. The second thing is to look at the social media they're already using. You know, and if you look on Facebook, you can find all sorts of groups where, you know, whatever your cause is. So if you're or interested in race relations in the U.S. and improving that, or you're interested in, you know, saving animal habitats, you can find groups that are working on any issue in the world. So just looking on the social media they're already using and seeing if there's a group they can find that they can be engaged in. Um, the third thing I would think is really looking up some of the alternative social media platforms that are working on these issues you know, at a more structural level. Um, and then the fourth thing I'd say, you know, well, well hold anybody, on before you before you before you go to four, what do you mean by three? I think that may be a little bit too removed right. for folks to okay. to grasp. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I think it's more like the infrastructure, the people who are building the field of social media and peace building. So I think PCDN is doing some of that. There's there's a conference every year that's called Build Peace, which happens in Massachusetts, and it brings together, I think, a couple hundred people who are working on tech and peace building, and a lot of it's on social media. So I think another one is the Alliance for Peace Building. 
where the U.S. Institute of Peace, they just launched a brand new center on tech and peace building, which a lot of it connects to social media tools. So it's almost like making sure, I mean, someone could spend hours and hours researching everything, but there are networks that already provide a lot of information and really understanding the work they're doing. Um, and then the fourth thing I would say that is important is a lot of people, again, getting beyond the clicktivism and the hashtagivism and the slacktivism, is really trying to understand how do you measure the impact of any aspect of social media. And for younger listeners who might want to pursue a career in this, there actually is an emerging career field where people can spend their time using social media to change the world. And there's actually people who will hire you to pay you to do this. And there's more and more jobs in this sector. But the, Social media for peace building doesn't mean just Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and Pinterest. Um, it means really knowing how to use it and measure the impact. So it's a, a lot of it's about storytelling, narratives, and also measuring the impact. So it's about, you know, so if you if you write a post on Facebook, how do you know has it had any impact? So a lot of it's about learning how to measure. Um, so you know, so it's really exciting. I think some of my students and alum are starting to go into this field in terms of some on the tech end actually building things and others on the social media, but making sure that for younger people who are thinking about college or you know, any kind of career to think, make sure they're getting the necessary training. Well, yeah, because that, that type of training is going to be very – things have changed so much that you know, video editing, graphic design becomes as central as what the message is, and then the exactly. other end of it of – how, how do we know that this actually matters? So you're going to go and say, listen, government, or you know, listen, uh, funders, we want to go and have you support us. Well, they want to know, you know, is this stuff actually working? So, you know, that's that's a really great range. So if, if folks, you know, why don't you, Craig, uh, again, you know, give the PCDN website, and then how else can folks reach you? You know, if they want to um, learn more about this or connect with you again. Sure. Yeah, so the web address is international peace and conflict, one word, dot org, and they can write to me. They can go to the website and just click on contact, and the emails will get forwarded to me. Or they can write to me. It's a very long email, but C like Charlie, Z like zebra, so C Zelizer at international peace and conflict, dot org. So I'm happy to be in touch with anybody, and you know I would encourage people to look at. You know, PCDN, the Build Peace Conference, the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Alliance for Peace Building, uh, you know, a lot of organizations in the U.S. and around the world are doing quite exciting things around this area. And I think, I think it's the scope of work and the impact is only going to increase. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of it is, is sort of the same thing of, you know, for, for say, um, somebody who's very new to this, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. There's these other resources that are available, but also – you know, there's nothing holding you back if you've got a good idea. It sounds like conflict mapping came, you know, out of that same uh, uh, mixture of a necessity and um, oh, yeah. and need. I mean, and, the, and, the, and the cool thing is now that, I mean, some, some people are advocating that in school everybody should learn how to code, which if you want to build an app, that's something that you would need to know. Um, so, it's you know, if people are passionate about technology or social media, learning how to code is great. But also it's getting easier now that, there's lots of, you know, you can, you can, lots of sites will help you just build an app, even if you don't know how to code. It's, it's, yeah, similar, so to, it's similar to web, websites. If, you know, 15 years ago, if you wanted a website, you had to hire somebody who knew HTML programming language. Um, and now basically anybody in the world can click, you know, build a website in three clicks. Right, 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 right. So, um, what closing thoughts uh, or comments do you have for our listeners today on, on this topic? Um, I mean, so I'll just tell my, my favorite group working for peace in the world is the Parent Circle, which is in Israel and Palestine. And everybody who's a member has lost somebody to the violence, and they have about 700 members. And it's an organization across the conflict divide, and they do a lot of things where they bring people together directly. Um, they do a lot of things through film and video, but they also have an amazing online project called Crack in the Wall. And you know, it's playing on words that the idea that there's both physical and mental walls separating Israelis and Palestinians. And they've created an online space open to anybody, though, though it's in Hebrew and Arabic, 
where they're trying to create dialogue about the conflict, and they're not trying to tell people what to say, but they want to create a space because it's so hard for Israelis and Palestinians to interact directly these days because of the ongoing conflict. You know, so that, to me, that's a really concrete example of people who lost family members can then help create an online space for people to interact and talk about the challenges they have. Um, that, I mean, to me, that's one of the most inspiring stories. And again, there's thousands of things like this going around the world. But I would also caution, again, social media is not a magic solution. And there's a lot of people using social media for quite negative things. And so it's, it's not all wonderful. So, so keep things in balance. Well, Craig, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I really felt that we learned a lot today. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.